So, here we are. It's a good start, right? God said, Behold, I've given you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the earth and every tree that has a seed-bearing fruit. It shall be for you food. So that's a pretty straightforward directive. And you saw in the greenhouse, it wasn't that hard either. You can just turn around and do it. So we have a history of live foods. Now, some people are saying that, oh, live foods is a new thing that we just thought up. <laughs> Not exactly, okay? So we're, we just went back 6,000 years. And before that, the Anukis and then the Pelagasians, they lived about 3,000 B.C. Average age was 200, and they were 100% live food. Average age was 200. Not no idea here. That's in southern Greece. I actually went there to research up if they really existed. Herodotus talked about them, but it's like, oh, I don't know. That's all I want. Um, and then 1300 B.C., we have the pharaoh Akhenaten and Nefertiti. And they were teaching live food to everyone, but pretty, it got more limited to the priests and priestesses. Here we are. Akhenaten, Nefertiti, what do we got here? Living greens. So it really was. Again, not exactly a new idea. 1300 B.C. And then uh, the Essenes, the inner circle of the Essenes, uh, were live fooders, and Pythagoras studied with them on Mount Carmel and came down enlightened. Okay, and he began teaching the live food. And then after the Romans came, they kind of, things got set back a little bit, a few thousand years. And it all began to pick up with Dr. Bircher Brenner in the late 1800s and 1890s, where he discovered some of the live food teachings of Pythagoras. And he began applying it, and then from him came Dr. Gerson, who you know from the Gerson healing. He actually had the first documented case of uh, diabetes type 2 cured. It was of Albert Schweitzer. So that was in the 20s, and then he had his 50 cases of cured cancer in 1937, then published in English, I think, in 1957. Okay, So he was a great pioneer. Uh, and then we have Edmund Bordeaux-Sicaly, who st started the kind of modern scene movement in 1929. He was also a physician, a naturopath, spoke 17 languages, and he introduced life with him, taught it from 1940 to 1970, just uh, south of the border, Mexico to, to uh, in Tijuana, in that area. Um, and then after him, then we have people like Victor Kovinskis and Brian Clements and myself who are kind of the next generation carrying the energy. And then, of course, Ann Wigmer is somewhere in there, um, you know, who, who's kind of more had an influence on Brian Clement and Victor Kovinskis. I only met her once or twice. My start into this whole thing was a totally different way, which is really spiritual. In 1975, uh, I received Shakti Pot from Swami Muktananda, and that is something that we're going to do tonight. I've been empowered by him to do that, to be a vehicle of that energy. And I went dissolved into nothing when I came down. A little voice rang out and said, You should learn to eat and live in a way that feeds the Kundalini. So that's how I got started in live foods. Okay? Well, it's a kind of a different start. And that's really the source of my work. It was the spiritual base, rather than the, let's say, the food base in a certain way. Okay. Now, diet affects consciousness, affects the mind, it affects our thoughts, and ultimately it affects our action. And that's a key thing to begin to understand. When I say food is a love note from God, I, I want you to think about it a slightly different way. Is if you are seeing the spark of God in every one, we call it equal vision, okay, then your food also has the spark of God in it, and you understand that's a gift from the divine. So the food we eat then becomes that which uplifts the network of life on the planet. It's 
a very different angle. It's not about nutrition. It's am I eating in a way that's creating holiness and it's uplifting the spark of life, the network of life on the living planet. That implies no spilling of blood in here. So our present future and survival of the planet depends on the consciousness of holistic live food veganism. And we'll see that. But one of the things I want to share here is one of my master's students uh, interviewed 525 people. And this is a little bit of the results from her thesis, okay? 87% improvement in emotional and mental and spiritual balance. It just seems to happen with the live food. And there are reasons we'll get into it, but that's what is the, the, the survey report. 400% decrease in imp uh, depression. And one of the keys is that live food stimulates the production of neurotransmitters, therefore creating an anti-depression effect. 300% um, decrease in anxiety, same kind of principle, that live food stimulates that. Different than vegan, okay? There's something going on with the live food that is making a difference because uh, of the energy. Uh, and a 32% decrease in addiction. It's just <coughs> what happens for people. And then we can accelerate it with fasting. So a 300% uh, increase in those reporting good to excellent energy levels. Okay? And then... 92% improvement in the immune system. This is what people basically felt. That chronic diseases significantly decreased. In other words, live food is a basis for healing most chronic diseases. Diabetes being one. Okay, 68% increase again uh, de in in those with no chronic disease. That's the way it happened. 200% increase in menses comfort, a 245% decrease in constipation, 18,000% uh, decrease in laxatives. <laughs> so, so what that what we're talking about here is is that live food goes through the the, the intestine 24 uh, to 36 hours. Cook food, even if it's vegan, organic, or whatever takes 40 to 100 hours to get through. That's the key. So it has more active uh, fiber, and when it's raw, it does get through better. You're still supposed to chew it, but still, <laughs> it gets through better. 20-fold uh, decrease in anandide use, 20% increase in all five senses. And this is the key. Dr. Breckman showed a 200% increase in energy levels in mice. So what he did is he took mice, he said it fed them exactly the same food cooked as raw. And when those mice had the raw food, they had 200% more endurance and energy. That's a, it was an elegant experiment, just really elegant in terms of really measuring it. So, why live food? One of the first things is I call it the unbroken wholeness. And it's a key to energetically begin to understand things. Unbroken wholeness. Now, when you cook it, you break the wholeness. Okay, now, I'm gonna now tell you something that you probably may not wanna hear. One of my master's students just hasn't handed in their thesis, but we tested blending. A lot of people go into blending. What we found is more than 10 seconds of blending and the energy of the food dramatically decreased. So I told you you wouldn't want to hear that, right? <laughs> and, and, and also, we don't have a measure of the antioxidants, but I'm sure is there a much, much greater uh, accident uh, experience with, with the whole blending as well. And that may, may be why the energy decreases. So uh, it's interesting. Um, so that's a wholeness. Okay, and a lot of people think it's live food. It's, give it 10 seconds. After that, we're really creating a broken wholeness, not unbroken wholeness, yeah. Well, then how, how would you make a, like a nut milk then, or a seed milk? Right, now that's a little bit different than taking food and blending it. Oh, okay. 
because you're doing the nut milk and you're squeezing it and you're doing all these things. Right. So what comes through is a little different. Mm -hmm. Now, um, in a juicing, if you do a juice press, like the Norwalk juicer, yeah. or what we have is with big industrial juice presses, it will last for three days. Its energy really is different. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're just, we're really talking about another level with a machine going and, this, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. So centrifugal juicing. Um, you lose a lot of energy. You do. So you need the ones that crush it, like the So much. But really press. The Norwalk is the, you know, private one. Right. And then we have like a, a big press. Same, same principle. Yeah. What about like a green star with the blue ears? It's better, but you're still... It's not at the same level. So oh, the press is the only one it, it stands above everything else. The green, you know, the, the, the star, which we used to use, which we used to use at the tree, um, is good. But it would, you know, degenerate in about an hour. But this keeps for three days when we tested it energetically with, with Carillion photography. It's yeah. called the, the press. Norwalk. Well, Norwalk Press for the individual person, yes. So let me just, if, you, if you're making a green smoothie, you've got to do it less than 10 seconds or less. 10 seconds or less, yeah. But you know, I'm going to tell you one other thing. But let me, let me also say, in, in all fairness, I have a lot of material. And once you get to know me a little bit, I can speak for the rest of the time just on what we're talking about. Okay? <laughs> so you got to be careful. I don't want to, I want to get you optimum use of the time. So it's just kind of a, like, kind of understand that. Because we try to research everything, honestly. You know, and, and I don't hold on to this is the way it's supposed to be. Later you'll see um, the whole idea of the, low fat, low protein, high complex carbohydrate, which is kind of, was the original belief systems in the, in, in the live food and, and still is the religious belief system, the vegan systems. There's a lot of problems with those. And if you are kind of unattached to the result, you just want the best, okay? You're gonna, you're gonna see that there's a real difference between the why and the how here. So I just wanna lay that out to you in that. And blending, it actually has some big downsides. Now, what's a better option? Okay, I'm, I'm restraining myself, but I'm still going to give you a little bit in depth here. The better option is chewing. <laughs> but why does chewing work versus blending? It does a lot of things. First, it increases your serotonin secretion by fivefold. That's a big deal. Second, it activates all the meridians. All the meridians go through your teeth. Third, when you chew, you prepare your body to digest the food, and you're activating all your digestive enzymes. Fourth, which I doubt if anybody's heard of, but about 30 years ago, I read a paper, uh, which I can't quite find now, where they're working with mentally retarded kids in England they said, this is too much work with their food and they're just, you know. So they began blending all their food. And after two years, many of the children suffered from a general de degeneration of the digestive tract. We call it use it or lose it. Okay? So there's some real downsides to the blending in the level we're talking about. And I just gave you some idea. So everything has its nuance, and you know we try to go into some depth with it. That's more of an all-day seminar, but you get what I'm saying here. So uh, expands the living field and offers a, the highest level of biophoton energy. Fritz Pop, he's still alive, and what he discovered is that we give off we give off biophotons. But when we're eating live food, we greatly enhance our biophoton energy that we take in. Now, there are a few pieces of that. What he found is the person eating junk food was giving off about 1,000 biophotons. A person who's eating cooked, organic, vegan food is giving off about 23,000 biophotons. A newborn baby is 44,000. And a run-of-the-mill live fooder 
83,000. If you're doing fasting and certain herbs and live food, it's up to 117,000. So that's a significant difference. That means you have that much more energy in your system that you're radiating it out. That's significant. Okay, so I'll, I'll, that's one of the things that's really uh, a key. And this is a cabbage leaf. Two cabbage leaves from the same cabbage, cooked and raw. And you can see there's a big difference here. So that's what we're beginning to say, because we, we just basically destroy the bi biophoton field. Now, you notice when I said 87% increase their mental, spiritual, psychic abilities and so forth. Well, what happens too is the whole universe is like a biophoton cloud. And so when you have more biophoton energy that you've taken in, you, you better resonate with the biophoton cloud and you become more psychic and more spiritually interested. That's kind of what we see happen pretty consistently. So there's a kind of, everything starts to tie together if that makes sense. And that's what we're talking about here. Okay, so it builds the subtle organizing energy fields. I call them selves. So every cell, every DNA, every organ has a field about it. Okay, and by eating live food, we energize the field. Um, and by eating junk food and so forth, we dissipate and disorganize the field. Okay, it's a little bit like the morphogenic field. Everybody has it, but we have the ability to increase the energy or decrease the energy, depending on what we're doing with our diet. And there are other things too, you know, breathing exercises, but I'm just talking about food right now. So this is a, a key principle. Um, then calorie restrictions by Dr. Steven Spindler. Now there's been a little bit in the news about calorie restrictions, but what Dr. Spindler found in 2001 was that if he fed uh, rats 40% less food, there was a 400% increase in their anti-aging genes, their anti-inflammatory genes, anti-cancer, <coughs> and antioxidant genes. So when we cook food, we lose 50% of the protein, 60 to 70% of vitamins and minerals, and about 95% of the phytonutrients. And that, let me just have a little tea, creates a situation where we're eating half as much. So with live food, you can literally eat half as much food and have a huge genetic upgrade. That's a huge advantage. Some pretty big differences. By just doing live food, it's called the less you eat the longer you live, you can literally eat half as much. And that's going to upgrade your whole genetic program. That is huge. Dr. Hans Eppinger of the first medical clinic in uh, Vienna, found that when he's measuring the cell, that when people weren't healthy, their cell charge, their cell battery charge, diminished. The only way he found he could increase it was with live food. Because there's a, a kind of electron transmission from the live food to us. And you couldn't do that with vitamins and minerals and everything else. So there is the, again, the, you know, cell membrane potential, which is your cell as battery. The live food literally recharges your physical batteries. Okay, now, Dr. Koloff made the point that you could upgrade your genetic program. At the time he did this research, they didn't have the language called epigenetic. What epigenetic is, is actually the interface between the environment and your, and your genes, genetic. And so he basically discovered when you, do, when you use live food, you're literally able to improve your epigenetic program, which is the expression of the genes. And then he, said, he found that that would occur at any age. That's of great value. Okay, enzyme preservation, you've heard about and I want to say it may be a little overrated. 
That's why I have it down here is not, you know, just seven, not one. Why? Well, when you do the research, they basically found that in the enzyme stomach, you're basically um, have the enzymes from the food of 60% uh, of a carbohydrate, 30% of protein, and 10% of fat. So you really don't get all the enzymes from the food you're eating, which is kind of a mythology that's been created in the life food movement. You don't get them all. You get some. That's not bad, okay? Also, methylation groups. Each cell has about 90 million, and cooked food will require 18 million per meal, and live food will require 12 million. So clearly, it's an improvement, but it isn't like that's it. You do need to take supplements. You do need to take digestive enzymes because we don't really, factually, uh, live food doesn't solve it by itself. So that may disappoint people. I mean, a lot of people are really attached to that, but I don't think there's that much is uh, uh, beyond what I just said in terms of that enzyme preservation is, is really, you get some, but you don't get 100%, okay? Um, we do get alkalizing and mineralizing. Now, a lot of people have these water alkalinizing devices. Now, live food alkalinizes in the natural way. What does that mean? You get calcium, you get magnesium, you get potassium. These are alkalinizing minerals. They build your body. They build your battery charge. They make things work. That's the normal, healthy way to do it. Just by taking alkaline water, it actually confuses the body. And some of the Japanese research shows something that uh, people may not want to hear, but after a few months, initially it's good to be more eloquent, after a few months it starts to act like a lie on the cells. Because it's a false alkalization, so health would tend to decrease after use over time. So if you have one of those machines, I generally recommend you go back to what water pH should be 6.8 to 7 so you can put it on neutral and be okay. Unless you're washing your skin and you need acid water. So that's an important thing. It's the minerals that are the key. That really has to do with meaningful alkalinization. Okay, that's what you get from the live food. Zeta potential is the energy in the water itself that's in the live food. So when you cook it, you lose that. And to a certain extent, when you dehydrate it, you lose about a third, okay? Doesn't mean you shouldn't dehydrate, particularly in the winter, but in the summer, you wanna minimize your hydrated food because it will further your general dehydration, okay? And I talked about the bile toxicity and of course, you've heard about the carbohydrate-rich foods. It increases acrylamide, which is like a cancer substance. It's like the browning that you get on, you know, your 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 grain products. Okay. Um, this is another thing uh, that some of our uh, master students have really raised a question. So in the '30s, uh, Dr. Paul Konchakov uh, said that cooked food you know, kind of overactivated and exhausted the immune system. So we did his experiment, repeated it, because no one else had repeated it. And basically what we found is hot dogs, you know, all the meats, particularly the hot dog and sausages, definitely overacted, overactivated the immune system and acted pretty much like blood poisoning. But, but what we also found is that when people just had cooked organic vegetables, there was no difference in the immune system response. Does that make sense? Yes. So that's a very significant, well, I don't know if that's true, except when you're doing with junk foods. Then the body does treat it like a foreign body, but it doesn't treat cooked foods like vegetables and you know, uh, so forth as a foreign body so you don't get an immune response and exhaust the immune system. So a little bit tips as you know our master students do this research that I kind of guide. It's like, well you need to get that answer. Let's what is it? What's up? Okay. And like 
as I teach, transfers the outer light to the inner light. So we, we have this photon, not biophoton, photon energy of the light of the sun and then it's been transferred to us. And that there's a special thing that seems to happen is that the more light food we take in, which is your greens, and your sprouts and all that, there is again elevation of the spiritual energy. Okay. I already said you can't eat your way to God, but this definitely helps become more and more a superconductor of the divine. So there is more light energy to that. And it's best for optimi optimizing spiritual life in general on the planet. And I have done some interviews and research on it and some spiritual groups where they were really switched to live food uh, versus the vegan. Uh, there was a 95% uh, consensus that it definitely improved their spiritual life. So there is something to live food having that inner outer light becoming inner light. So those are some of the things. Now this is organic uh, and that's part of the story. And so I'm going to explain what this is briefly just to make a point. What is this? This is Yaki Indian kids in Mexico, study done by the University of Arizona, and they basically found that the kids in the valley couldn't barely write, and the kids in the foothills could. How come? Okay, nobody knows. I'll tell you what it is. Pesticides and herbicides go downhill. So the kids in the valley were more exposed to pesticides and herbicides, and they had significant neurological uh, breakdown and in the, the micro motor but also gross motor but also emotions. So it's equal to live food in a certain way of significance is the whole idea of feeding the kids organic. Other research shows that uh, kids on organic food have somewhere between one quarter to one sixth the pesticides and herbicides in their system as kids eating the commercial food. That's a huge edge in the story, okay? And there was a, there's a, a experiment was done in 1997 in Appleton, Wisconsin, they found in the high school level when they went organic, okay? I didn't say live, I didn't say, you know, vegan. I just said they just went organic. There's a significant increase in uh, academic scores, in athletic scores, and also decrease the amount of violence agitation. In fact, in the high schools, they literally, they didn't need the police anymore. So it, we've got to look at this whole organic thing. There is research out there, when, what we call combined studies, okay, that shows that in general, uh, organic food has 25% more nutrient value. Some studies show it's got 400% more. Okay, it doesn't matter, but the average is 25%. And life, uh, organic food also has far more antioxidant, antioxidant power to it. Okay, so those are some of the kind of basic things. But we can see pesticides and herbicides are neurotoxins. The average kid born today has 200 uh, toxins in its body, 180 of them are carcinogens, and 217 of the different toxins are neurotoxins. So it's really a hard life, you know, for our newborns. And I like mothers, prospective mothers, to do a lot of fasting uh, in preparation, not fasting while they're pregnant, but before that, in preparation for that. And it does make a difference. On our program, uh, we, we get, after two weeks, you, you really get pretty much 100% of all the pesticides, herbicides, and stuff out of that. I check for 27 different lead, mercury, cadmium, and it goes down the line. Okay, so it's, a, it's not a big price to pay, and I, I suggest the prospective father also do that, and we got survival of the species. So this is uh, a peach, and you can see the energy coming off. This is a corn sprout, uh, I'm sorry, a radish sprout. This is a corn sprout, and 
you know, I'm not recommending corn because it's 86% is genetically engineered, but this is a little bit before that. This is cacao. Wow. Nice energy. Cacao is interesting. It seems to be okay for non-diabetics. Diabetics, it definitely raises the blood sugar. So it's a little tricky. Cacao is tricky, and I basically will say this is something you want to use for party food. Okay. Pretty much everybody who's cons I've tested who's consistently taking cacao has weakened adrenals. So I just mentioned that as part of the story here. This is a person, uh, same person, kind of like the Dr. Breckman uh, study, and he basically found that the person eating junk food had, didn't have any field at all, and this is a person just having uh, organic, veganic food, but cooked. Is but, that the hand? Or what, what yeah, it's fingertips. So there's no field there with junk food, so it really makes a difference, you know, even the difference between cooked organic versus junk. It's like we do affect ourselves. What we eat does affect our consciousness, does affect our, action, our, our actions. This is the pineal gland, and this is within a living human being, and you can see the light that's being given off. It's like, well, that's impressive. Okay, and this is the pituitary gland. That's impressive too. So we're giving off light. This is norepinephrine. This is epinephrine. Now, it's interesting because Kundalini is described as a, a coiled at three and a half times at the base of the spine, and this is like the Kundalini which I was like, oh, that's interesting. This is like crystallography. This is sperm. And, I'm sorry, that's testosterone. This is estrogen. So this is a little bit rounded. And so that's a, a kind of a, a little bit about live food. Now, the other thing that's important about live food is water. <coughs> now, we have different... Um, physiological types, but in general, with age, the average kid is born at about 70-75% hydration. With age, you can go down to 50% hydration. That's a lot, okay? What that means, your brain shrinks, your spinal cord shrinks, you see how people with age they get, okay? So hydration is key. So live food helps you maintain yourself with biologically active water. Let's go a little further. It also helps clear the toxins out of your stomach and it swells the stomach and the lining so it's much more protected uh, from the <coughs> digestive enzymes. So when you drink like even 15 minutes before meals, you're creating a flushing and then the lining, you know, swells up, and, you know, becomes hydrated and actually protects you. That's worthwhile to get that just simple concept. The knee or all the joints Water is the lubricant. So if you get dehydrated, you're more likely to have inflamed knees, knee or joint troubles. And this is the brain. This is a hydrated brain, and this is a dehydrated brain. And it does really happen. So we're not exaggerating. Most people, after the age of about 45, lose about 1% of the brain size per year. It accelerates with uh, B vitamin deficiencies. It accelerates with dehydration and a variety of other causes, okay, which that's another story for another time. So hydration is really important. You don't want to become a prune brain. Okay. So we want to keep hydrated. And live food has and is hydrated. And even that, you still need to drink water according to your constitution. So how do you know when you drink enough water? Your yeah, your urine is a clue. So what is it? It's a simple way to do it. With no mathematics. Are you urinating every two hours? Are you urinating every two hours? If you're urinating every four hours, you're dehydrated. You get what I just saying? It's so simple. And that is key to really figuring it out. So some people need six glasses of fluid, some need eight, some need 12. It depends on your constitution. But the bottom line is, are you urinating every two hours? That's a simple, simple way to understand it, and it's the most accurate. No mathematics in that one. 
Okay, and this is the whole circulatory system. When you're dehydrated, it begins to, to close down and protect the brain and the heart, and other areas go down, and you get more high blood pressure, too. Here's the discs. So, 75% of your disc is water. So what are we seeing when people shrink with age? What do you think is happening? Your, de your discs are dehydrating. They're only 25% material. Your discs are dehydrating. There's no need to shrink with age. I may be a fraction taller now than I was when I was 20. Could be. I, it's very close. But the point is, proper hydration, you aren't going to get that degenerative disc. You're not going to get that shrinking. Some people may say that's a benefit. I certainly do. Okay? So that's key. Hydration. Live food hydrates you. It also brings in the most amount of oxygen as well. Okay. Food's a dynamic force which interacts with the humans on the physical body level, which we're talking about, and the mind-emotional level, which we've talked about, and also the energetic and spiritual levels. That's how we really begin to understand what nutrition is about. Okay? Because you can... Right now I'm writing a... completing a book with a Montessori teacher where I'm talking uh, alive and awake parenting. Okay? And you can make an argument okay, that if you're just having 5 or 10% flesh food, it, the, the results aren't too different in longevity. If you're only considering the physical plane. But here's the point. That's not what nutrition is about. It's the emotional plane, the mental plane. When you take in you know, an animal, it, it's been killed, it's filled with fear and anxiety, and all these negative hormone type influences at the point of death, it's agitating your mind. And it really limits what the point of life is, which is to be aligned with the will of God. And we weren't really meant to be killing animals and taking in all the blood, fear, misery, and so forth that goes on. That's the difference. And it's a whole, the ecology is different. Um, Great to quieter mind, a quieter body, uh, right relationship with all cultures. It, it's in, you know, it, it's huge. The difference when you look at does this uplift the network of life on the planet? That's a really key question. Then all your arguments, which you may or may not have, with meat eaters. Well, if I just eat five percent, what difference does it make? On the physical plane, not much. On the other planes, a whole lot. Okay, so interaction and assimilation of the dynamic forces of food with the dynamic forces of our total being. Kind of get that idea that there's some more going on. So people want to talk to you on the physical plane only. It really isn't a full discussion of what's going on. And so you're getting some ways to think and talk about it that this is beyond that. Now we do take energy in cosmically from the sunlight, from our breath, and from the earth frequencies, and in the chakra system, and then the physical food, which is 5 to 10% of our actual food intake, is, is from our actual physical food. Okay. It's maybe 5%, but it also causes a whole lot more of the trouble. <laughs> it's very weighted, okay? So nutrition is what we absorb into our overall body, mind, spirit from the different density levels that have precipitated from the cosmic force all we're talking about. But when you get it, we got to be open to the higher cosmic forces. That's the point. We are a living crystal. And so we're vibrating with the frequency of that. Okay, and that's how we actually communicate. So we're communicating. We have brain as, you know, uh, brain waves and EKGs, heart waves, cosmic forces, thought forms, and a lot of it resonates with the bone, which is our primordial beingness, okay? The bone is it's a crystal in itself. And that communicates with our cells and our organs and so forth. So that's the key. Now, the other key is we're taking in the light to the chlorophyll. And there's a real relationship between the plant world and the humans. So there, it takes the chlorophyll, which has magnesium in it, 
the chlorophyll is identical to hemoglobin, but it, you know, has an iron instead of a magnesium. So again, food enzyme stomach where we digest, but again, remember, we're doing 60%, 30%, and only 10% of the lipases that we need to do this. So it's a, it's a, it's a halfway truth. Verily, this is Sir Arthur Eddington, who actually proved many of uh, Albert Einstein's theories. Okay? Verily, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a scientific person to pass through a door. Okay, and whether the door be a barn door or a church door, it may be wiser that he or she should consent to be an ordinary person and walk in rather than wait till all the difficulties involved in a really scientific ingress are resolved. <laughs> so you kind of have to look at, is it totally proof? Well, it took them 30 years to prove smoking causes cancer, right? <laughs> it's like, this is a lot of different information I've given you, but the point I'm making is, it's a reasonable bet, given all the data that you've just heard, that we can say that the live food diet that's been around for at least 6,000 years um, is something that has real validity and is the optimal diet. Okay. Now, just so you don't mishear that, the study we did was about eight, people who were 80% live food. And that, to me, in my clinical observation in the last 40 years, is if you can get 80%, that's really, really good. 95 to 100% is, you know, like a whole another dimension. But ultimately, if you just stay with 80% for, you know, a few years, you'll get many of the benefits that you will get with the 95% to 100%. So I just kind of mentioned that for perspective, okay? And... The other thing is, sometimes people get all excited with all that. That's good. You should be inspired, right? We want that. And want to go 100% live, and they, they're not really ready for it. I rather see people succeed at 80, you know, start 50%, work your way up to 80 for a year or two, until you're stable, and then you can start to move it up. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? You've got to treat yourself ni easily, nicely. There's no hurry. If you're on live food, you're going to live longer. <laughs> yeah. Men live 7.3 years long, 3, 4 years longer. Women live 4.4 years longer. I don't know what the difference is, but that's what the statistics say. You know? Okay. So there we are. It's not totally proven, but we're going in the right direction. Okay. Food is a dynamic force which interacts with humans in the physical body level. Okay, we already do the slide. Okay. Nutrition is what we absorb into overall body, mind, spirit from the different density levels. So I'm making the point again. What just happened? It repeated itself. Okay, here we go. No, it got repeated twice for some reason. Now, this is the spiritual aspect. So I mentioned my work was really since 75 being inspired into the whole life food movement as a way to support and feed the energy of Kundalini, primarily. So this is a model. Actually, this is an inner vision. And I'll, I'll go just, we have 72,000 nadis. This is in the yogic system. And we have three main nadis. Ida Pangali Shishumna, OK? Uh, Ida and the, uh, Pangali, Ida, and then Shishumna. And within that, there's a Brahma nadi which is the fourth level. I'm not going to give you all the dynamics here, but you can see that little white line. Can you see it? See it right there? And it rises above this point. The other's in here. And that is the Brahma Ronda, which is a particular place that exists. And when that's activated, you can taste the nectar coming down. These are all direct experiences I've had, so I'm not talking from a book here. And ultimately, there's emerging of Shiva and Shakti, or in the um, Tree of Life, Nok, Sacred Feminine, Azir and Pen, Sacred Masculine. So that merging happens, the oneness returns to us. So now, at another more subtle level, we have 
uh, what we call um, we have vata, kapha, and pitta. And those are uh, energy types in Ayurvedic. But then we have a more refined thing, so pitta is now called tejas, which is the inner fire inside the nadis. Instead of vata, which is air, we have prana, which is the energetic area. And then instead of um, earth and water, kapha, we have ojas. Okay? And one of the problems if you aren't paying attention on a live food diet is you get a whole lot of prana with your leafy greens, okay, and a lot of fire in, in different ways. But the ojas, which lines the nadis, doesn't get built up unless you have, you know, are making sure you're doing that. So there's a little bit of an air I noticed back in the 80s with a lot of the live fooders is they were really uh, chronically out of balance. They had an air imbalance. They weren't grounded. Okay, And so I began focusing on ojas. So ojas is the deep primordial vigor and reserve. It's deeper than sexual energy. Okay, It's your deep, in the Chinese we call it jing. Okay? It's a deep jing energy and a life force. We have pre and post needle jing, but what I'm saying is it's primordial. It, it's what makes you be alive. Okay, so it's very important. So I start looking at ways to support the ojas, which is pretty important here. Okay, so one thing is fat. Now first you've got to get fat doesn't make you fat. Okay, <coughs> what makes you fat is carbohydrate. So I want to be very clear about that, and the French knew about that in the 17th century. Not new information. Okay, it, it seems a little counterintuitive, but it really isn't. Okay, um, but we're not doing a talk on diabetes. So, plant-based protein, bee pollen is the primordial ojas food. Why is that? Bee pollen is the semen of the plant world, and semen is the primordial ojas. Okay, does that make sense? So, it's and of course bee pollen has it also has twenty percent. Uh, um, lecithin, which is not soy lecithin. It's got 15% protein, thousands of enzymes, almost all the B vitamins except B12. It's super, but it's an energy that we're talking about. It's a primordial ojas. It's, it's the, the great ojas food. And, okay, Elf, uh, the E3 Live has been shown to have the long chain omega 3s. DHA and EPA, which are fundamentally important for brain development, nervous system development, and have an antidepressant effect as well. Then you have your concentrated proteins, chlorella, chlorella spirulina, and then coconut oil, which is uh, ojas food in itself. And in just a minute, you'll see that the real problem is low cholesterol, not high cholesterol. But you have to wait a minute to see why that's okay. Um, and then we have the short chain omega, uh, omega-3s, hemp seed, and, uh, and flax seed, and chia seed. And with coconut oil, they convert into long chain. Usually the conversion rate is 1 to 3 percent. It jumps to 6 to 10 percent. So that's doubling or tripling the conversion to long chain omega-3. So that's pretty significant. That's one of the roles that coconut oil does. Okay, uh, now we have herbs, and we're not doing a class in herbology, but we have maca, which is very good, ginseng, shatavari, licorice, rhodiola, which is good for memory, goji berries, and all these things. The astragalus has been associated with lengthening a certain extract of uh, uh, the telomeres. Are people familiar with telomeres? Okay. So with age, your telomeres decrease in size. And with the proper lifestyle, which is the, when I talk about the six foundations and the lifestyle we're talking about, you can actually increase it about 10% a year. That research just came out. It was research done by Dean Ornish. That's very exciting. So these are the herbs. Uh, schizandra balances all the 12 meridians and so forth. Gynostimnia is longevity herb. 
And here's a way of living, getting adequate sleep. And that's no problem in, in, in New York and Connecticut, right? You get adequate sleep. <laughs> so what's adequate sleep? About seven hours, minimum of seven hours. All the research is saying that. You can function at six hours, but not so well in the long run, okay? Love, devotion, sexual balance. And, and they really found something really interesting. Three different medical research things, different than some of the Taoist and yoga teachings, is that men and women who had intercourse three times a week actually lived longer. Men lived two years longer. And three different major studies show this. And uh, women lived a half year longer. So people benefited. <laughs> I don't want to go further than that. <laughs> well, let it be. But it counters the whole idea that if you're having intercourse, losing semen, da da da, it wastes your energy, and for women, it weight depletes your energy too. You know, they just did it simple. Like, are you living longer or not? That's a pretty straightforward question because that's the life force energy. So, I, um, uh, the moderate lifestyle. Now, here are things that really deplete the ojas also. Because remember, ojas is not just food. Overworking, over-restraint, over-playing, insufficient sleep, drug use, which decreases the prana as well, are things that diminish your ojas, okay, or your jing. So this is a person, uh, or this is a brain pre-LSD, this is post LSD. So I'm just giving you for impression because this is again like a whole lecture, right? Okay. Okay, that's a normal brain. This is a particular uh, system of uh, looking at perfusion. And just notice, there aren't a lot of holes in it, right? Okay, this is a three year his uh, an 18 year old with three year history of four times a week marijuana. Now, it doesn't look so good. 16-year-old, two-year history of daily abuse of marijuana. So, and marijuana may be good for pain relief and for treating certain kinds of cancer, but people are trying to expand it to that's a, it's a good thing. This isn't the truth of the situation, okay? I actually did research on THC in 1970 and did show it was a very good hypnotic. It does put you to sleep, mm -hmm. metaphorically but literally. Okay, so uh, here's a 38-year, 12-year history daily use. Look at that, okay? And here's a t 10 years, 28-year-old, from 18 weekend use. It's just, look at this, you know? So there's a lot of research that shows maybe marijuana isn't so good for you, even though it's good for some kind of cancer, and even though it is good for pain, pain relief, if nothing else is really available in your stage four or whatever cancer. This is really interesting. Cannabis users have a 4.8-fold increase in risk of a heart attack one hour after smoking. That's interesting, okay? Uh, in the British Medical Journal, marijuana users who drove within three hours of smoking had a double their risk of an accident. <laughs> yeah, it's understandable. But we're, you know, we have a world that's saying it's cool, everything's fine, but it isn't really fine. It's good for A and B, but not holistic. Look at the, the story. Okay. Is that reversible with the use of with light? Oh, well, we got to get to the story. <laughs> Smoking marijuana affects brain development. This is a really important. This is the National Institute of Drug Abuse. And basically what they're saying is smoking marijuana interferes with your normal brain development. So when teenagers or less, okay, we are actually disrupting the normal brain development, particularly in socialization and particularly in intimacy. Those are big breakdown areas, not good for like later on in your life and stays with you, okay? So this is a big deal, affects brain development, okay? And um, there's a direct correlation between adolescent pot smoking and increased relationship and intimacy difficulties irrespective of your social upbringing. In other words, it's independent of all the classes. Every class is affected, okay? Smoking it regularly 
affects your brain in a way that impacts intimacy capacity. It affects the brain immediately and in the long term, okay, even after you've quit to a certain extent. Okay, and then the Washington Post says teenagers smoke pot daily are 60% more, less likely to complete high school. That's a big deal. You know, it's a big deal. So that, that we're talking real statistics over periods of time. Colorado marriage, marijuana smoking among teens is up, and it is connected to increase in suspensions, expulsions, and a 57% increase in emergency room visits. And uh, traffic fatalities among marijuana positive drivers are up 100%. That's Colorado, so we're really test, they're testing uh, kind of some more or less liberal thinking. Rates of use among high school seniors was up 22% uh, in 2011, and illicit drug use has risen 43% among his, Hispanic boys and 42% uh, among Afro-American teenage girls. So this is a concern, obviously. Was that last thing about just drugs in general, or just marijuana? Mm -hmm. It was more... Uh, more marijuana, as I was referring to. Studies show high doses of marijuana can cause temporary psychotic reactions, such as hallucinations and paranoia. And, and I'll, I'll tell you that that happens more than infrequently. As a psychiatrist, you would see this. And also, people dipping into schizophrenia. It definitely has been associated with an increase in schizophrenia. I've had people, they smoke and they become schizophrenic, and it may take them a year or two to recover. And you do everything you can not to have them do this again, which often they do. So it's 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 not a it's a really serious thing. It ruins people's lives. Okay, marijuana use promotes the greater rates of sexual dysfunction, loss of sexual and erectile function. Okay, second leading substance for which people receive drug treatment. We tend to think it's other things, but it's really not. Okay, marijuana potency has tripled over the past 20 years, and it is linked to lower IQ, as much as eight point drop. And that's because it actually destroys brain cells. In 1970, when I was doing research at THC to get it, I had to do a review of all the literature, and they studied people in Jamaica for 20 years, and regular, regular hashish and marijuana users, and there was a tremendous loss in brain cell function, uh, a tremendous increase in cognitive de decline after 20 years. But you could measure the size of the brain. They really shrunk the brain. So this is what we're talking about. So it goes on a little bit. But that's making the point. Marijuana uh, use is associated with addiction, respiratory illness, and cognitive development. This is all National Institute of Health. That may do the fact that marijuana smoking increases the fourfold concentration of the chemicals. People affected by marijuana addiction, as well as cigarette, uh, you know, as well as cognitive development, and long-term research on pot shows that chronic users will suffer brain cell loss. Oh, what to do? Everybody's looking a little puzzled. Oh my God, I did that right. Heroin and methadone. Look at the brain. You know, 39-year-old, 25-year used to have heroin. When I was at Columbia Medical School, I, I really got that methadone was no different. And so it's interesting that this research is done with methadone, too. It really, really puts holes in the brain. 40-year-old, seven-year history of methadone. You know, and then heroin 10 years before that. This is not really for a good brain. Cocaine and methamphetamine. Same thing, okay? And cocaine, methamphetamine again, this is a hard thing. You just, it goes on, okay? This is alcohol. Oh. It looks really bad. <laughs> well, it's about 13,000 brain cells with each martini, putting it in perspective. Can you explain and what we're seeing? This is a uh, brain perfusion uh, research that is basically showing uh, a breakdown in brain structure, okay? And we're looking at the effect of alcohol 
on the brain structure. Thank you. Okay. You mean like the first um, loss of the brain mass? That is exactly what I mean. <laughs> and, and of course you know that with alcohol because you have all these dementia is related to alcohol use. It's not that new information. This is just what it looks like. That's all what we're seeing here, okay? This is alcohol. Uh, four years, 18 years of daily use. 44-year-old with 18 years of daily use. Um, it goes on. I'm just giving you an idea. Now, is there hope for healing? I'm sure everybody in the audience has worrying about that question, right? <laughs> Most everybody. And the answer is yes, there is. So look at this. This is a undersurface of the brain. Look at that. A one-year drug and alcohol free. So we really can get some healing. Undersurface uh, with a, a year break too. So there is some healing. I do a lot of work with neurotransmitters and building the brain back up. So all this gets accelerated. The healing gets accelerated. There is hope. This is, again, uh, one-year abstinence. So you get the big picture. Our brain is key. We have to protect it. All the drugs really cause a degeneration of the brain one way or another. Okay? So I'm going to just move on. Um, we could spend hours, obviously, on what you just saw. But this is an overview. Thank you.